If you're a Florida homeowner, taking care of your lawn and knowing how to landscape can be really tricky. Hey everybody, Melanie Atkinson here, Realtor with Smith & Associates in beautiful Tampa Bay, Florida. And I am so excited today because I love landscaping. And I'm here with a true landscape expert, RJ Howell, who owns Innovative Landscapes here in Tampa. He is going to teach us all about lawn care and Florida-friendly landscaping. I have a lot of clients that come from out of state and they're obsessed with palm trees and I understand why. So let's get a quick rundown on palm trees. One of the big mistakes I see is people using palm trees where they really don't belong. Yes. Where do palm trees belong? Well, it depends on climate and it depends on the type of palm. Palm trees are used all the way up to Virginia on the East Coast and all the way down to the Keys. There are a lot of different types of palm trees. Just in this backyard mm -hmm. alone, there are a lot of palms. Can you point at them and tell sure. us what we're looking at? Sure. Well, this is one of the more common palms. The tall palm here is the queen palm. A lot of people mistake this for a palm. It's actually a white bird of paradise. That's the white bird. I yep. have one of those in my yard as well. Pygmy date, uh, very, also very popular in our area because it's such low care. And then, of course, one of my favorites is the Bismarck palm. The Bismarck palm. So I definitely have used that name wrong before. Then there's a triangle palm over there as well. What I like about the triangle palm is it's not the typical green of a normal you know, run-of-the-mill queen palm, foxtail, but it's not quite as silver uh, in color on the fronds as the Bismarck palm. Yeah, I mean, this is a, an impact tree. This sure is. is something that you need a lot of space for just Absolutely. because the scale of it's really big. So in a backyard like this, we have a lot of space so that it works here. Um, do people use those in front yards too? Sometimes, again, it depends on the scale of the, ho of the home um, and the size of the yard. Yeah. Uh, one of the things um, that I've also seen people do that's a mistake is take a palm like this when it's very small, plant it too close to the house, plant it you know, as a foreground item closer to the curb, uh, and what happens is as it grows, it's very distracting from everything behind it. That makes sense. I think a lot of people are surprised when they come to the Tampa Bay area about how many oak trees are here. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a huge fan of oak trees in general because of the maintenance. Talk to me about oak trees here in Florida, what you should do if you have one and you can't take it out. <laughs> Ooh, that's an amazing question. Super important, of course, keep it trimmed up, keep the canopy raised, always keep leaves off from your house, never want the tree touching your house. It's a super highway for insects. Mm -hmm. Oak trees, plants underneath need to be shade tolerant, they need to be acid tolerant because oak leaves and acorns produce so much acid, they contribute to adjusting the pH of the soil. So you need uh, plant the plants that would appreciate the appropriate pH for under an oak tree. And you know what those plants are, of course. right? Okay, yeah. so I mean, I have no idea what those plants are. That's, I didn't realize that. I think my concern with oak trees, especially the big canopy ones that we see a lot in South Tampa and, and areas like that, are they don't get any light below them for the grass or anything. Is there a certain grass that works better under an oak tree? So there's, uh, there's a couple issues inherent with oak trees and grass. They don't get along so well. One of the issues is the roots actually will steal a lot of the nutrients, they'll steal the moisture so the grass doesn't get what it needs. And also the sunlight. Every grass needs some sun. There are certain varieties of grass that are more shade tolerant than others. Like? Shade tolerant grasses would be Seville, Bitter Blue. There's constantly new strains of St. Augustine grass coming out. It's, it's interesting because once sometimes we get one problem solved, there's another problem. Right. So. Right. It's an ever-changing world. <laughs> it, it definitely is. Keeping with taller trees for a little bit, and then we'll go a little bit to the smaller ones. What are some of your other favorite trees to use for impact landscaping, either in a backyard or a front yard? My personal preference, and I get a lot of clients that move here from up north, is style blending. They think that they want super tropical. That's what we have here. Sometimes they want a feel of tropical with something that's more familiar like a northern, you know, northeast, midwest type of flair. Mm -hmm. Some of the trees that would give that would be a Japanese blueberry, a variety of holly trees, podocarpus, things that are, you know, more evergreen mm -hmm. um, and more structured. What's your take on magnolias? 
I like magnolias. There's definitely a place for them. They are not low maintenance. They have a lot of leaf drop. They have seed drop and they require a bit of care. They're beautiful when they're take, well taken care of and put in the right place. And of course, the blooms look wonderful. So if we're talking about plants that kind of grow to a mid-level, where would you use those and what are some of your favorites? Excellent question. Use of shrubs and woody ornamentals. One of the big mistakes that I see um, with do-it-yourselfers so they go out to a home improvement store or a box store, buy a plant that's six inches tall now, buy a plant that's 10 inches tall now, plant the six inch tall plant in front of the 10 inch tall plant, not knowing the growth pattern. The front plant outgrows the back plant. They're like, what did I do? Yes, it happens you know, all the time. And it's it, all the time. So I think it's really important to not only know what type of soil the plants need, what type of sun the plants need, but also their growth habits, their growth patterns, so that you can have a well-balanced landscape with graduation and some symmetry from foreground to background. Right, so I'm assuming what you mean by that is smaller in the front and taller in the Absolutely. back. Absolutely. Yes. Let's talk about sunlight. You just mentioned sunlight a little bit. It's a conversation that I have with a lot of my clients regarding their front yards and their backyards and which way they face. We get a lot of direct sunlight in the southern part, especially during the winter. Right. And then obviously the west and the east get the morning and the, the afternoon sun. Is there a particular sun direction that you like for most general landscaping? Not necessarily, and I'm going to tell you why, is because there's such a vast variety of plants that we're able to use in this climate. We're in zone 9b here. The sky's the limit with plant choices and variety. What does 9b mean? There's different plant zones. So it's cold hardiness and then of course you, in addition to that you'd want to pick drought hardy plants because in the spring we don't get an, a lot of rain. But you also want plants that when it comes the rainy season, they're not gonna grow beyond your means to maintain them. Yes, some of them grow very quickly. The non-Southern growing plants grow slower, so yes. they're easier to maintain. Well, well, not all of them. Ease of maintenance. Okay, well, you, you brought us into maintenance. So I like to remind people when I see what I know of as Florida-friendly landscaping as being pretty low maintenance in general. Do you find that a lot of what is typically used for Florida landscaping to be pretty low maintenance, or should we all be doing more maintenance? Well, of course. I mean, that's a loaded question, right? So <laughs> He does own a landscape company. <laughs> so, I mean, maintaining your plants, low maintenance doesn't mean no maintenance. When you say low maintenance, it may be very different than what I mean by low maintenance. So that's true. All plants are gonna require water. They're gonna require trimming. They're gonna require some sort of organic matter and, and they need to be fed, fertilized. That's where a lot of homeowners just don't know a lot. They don't know to fertilize, and if there's mm -hmm. not somebody professional taking care of them, then they don't fertilize plants. I, I know a lot about plants, and I don't fertilize my plants. Absolutely. Maybe somebody does. I should probably check. Let's talk about that and talk a little bit about fertilization. So fertilization is really important, and it's really important that you have professional guidance because you can use the wrong fertilizer, you can over-fertilize, you can under-fertilize, but now with the algae issue that we have here, in Florida with the red tide issue that we have here in Florida and runoff. It's never been more important to understand what you're getting into with fertilizer than it is right now. That's a great point and thank you for making that. We definitely don't want to over fertilize anything because all of it does get into our groundwater and eventually makes its way back into our bays and, and rivers and golf and everything like that. Sure. So we don't want to contribute anymore to the red tide problem. Absolutely and a lot of people use high nitrogen fertilizers because they get an instant effect. There's a lot of minor elements and trace elements that are necessary for a plant to thrive mm -hmm. long term. So it's important for the plant viability or tree viability or grass viability that you understand and are able to balance that. Why don't you take us on just a little tour of this tropical yard Okay, um, sure. and give us kind of your, your thought process when you were designing it. Tell us a little bit about the plants that we're looking at. Sure, absolutely. I already spoke to you about the white bird of paradise. Yes. Um, this here is an orange bird of paradise, so they're kind of dwarf variety. One mm -hmm. blooms white, one blooms orange. We have here... Which you keep that very trimmed. Mm -hmm. So I have one in my yard that has a lot of growth at the bottom. Right. So yours is, is much better trimmed than mine. I mean, it depends on what you're going for. I would say that mine needs to be trimmed right now, but... Well, mine um, does too, right. I'm sure. So. <laughs> this is a tough time of year to keep up with everything. You trim it and it grows, but right. we're, we're doing okay now. So yeah, it depends on the effect that you're going for if you like a low cover and you're trying to create a buffer, 
let it grow from the bottom. If you are wanting to use it more as an upright feature, then of course keep it legged up, we'll yeah. say. Yeah, I love the yellow one. Yeah, this is called the Dracenia, a lemon lime Dracenia. They add a lot of accent color. They will grow taller. In this particular case, you can see that this is the tallest items are in the background and then foreground to background, there's a graduation. Not always the case, but typically the rule with the exception being features okay. or anchor plants or trees. And then the red ones are? This is called an anti loo quarter line. It's a type of tie plant, not to be confused with the red sister that gets really leggy and That's pink. what I thought it was, yeah. Yes. And they do get very leggy. Now, if we have cold mm -hmm. or anything here, and occasionally we do get below frost, do these do okay? And if they don't, will they just grow back? It got down to about 28 degrees for three or four hours here earlier this winter. I did not cover anything. All these plants were here and they did fine. If I were a little bit further north, maybe even 20 miles further north, I would definitely say the plants that are here should be covered under a frost blanket. This is a firecracker. They actually were blooming. They're slowing down on their bloom cycle now because of all the rain. I like the contrast and texture and they still have that tropical flair. And a lot of people from up north really like them because they almost remind them of like an asparagus fern or, you know. They're very wispy. They yes. are very wispy. Yes, I like them. What is this? Let's this is a Japanese this. blueberry. Oh, this is what you were talking mm -hmm. about. So I always thought this was a holly tree. It's very Does it similar. Does it look similar to a it, holly tree? It is. Okay. I'll show you a holly tree in a second. And this is Eliocarpus, which is also known as a Japanese blueberry. It does not fruit, it's just an ornamental. Okay. So, and it's evergreen, stays green year round. So a holly tree, are those, I thought the berries were bad for dogs. Some are, Some absolutely, are? but typically a dog won't go up to a holly tree and eat the berries. <laughs> I guess that's Not true. This is a very uh, common plant that we see around, so tell us about that one. Uh, that's an Arbicola trinette, uh, also known as a dwarf chefflera, and this one is variegated yellow and green. You must cringe when you go into new home communities and you see the builders put mm -hmm. up plants. They'll put like one of these and then, you know, another plant that doesn't match at all. Exactly. And it, it just looks totally... Haphazard? Haphazard <laughs> is a great word for it. So anyone buying new construction, you probably are going to want to uh, redo some of your uh, landscaping. This tree uh, looks a lot like what you were talking about with it, because it, to me it looks more like a northern tree. Very so much what's so. what's this one? So this is called an oak leaf holly. It's very slow growing, really requires very, very minimal maintenance. And you can kind of trim it like a typical northern holly tree. It's a little prickly. It is a little prickly, but that's the beauty about it is you don't need to really mess with it too much. That, yeah, I guess that's true. And they're a nice dark green staple. And this I see a lot in a shorter version. Right, and this is a podocarpus. This can be used as a plant or kind of as a tree, like a holly tree, it does berry. This is the upright, a larger variety. They do very, very well in Florida. Yeah, again, to me, it looks a little bit more like a northern tree. Well, and, and a lot of people mistake this for a yew, northern yew. Oh, okay. So definitely are plants in the north that very much look similar to some of the staples that we use here. There's a tree that's a long, skinny, a piney tree that a lot of uh, houses with a Mediterranean look tend to have in front of them. Yeah. What are those? Italian, those are, uh, they're evergreens and they're, and they're called Italian cypress. Okay. That is, would be a Mediterranean flare. That's something that you might see in Greece, you yeah. know, in, in that part of they the world. They create a lot of height, but they're very skinny to me. They're, they're not the most interesting plants, but I do see them around a lot, especially in higher end neighborhoods. I think they have their place, right? This is a queen palm. Correct. You have let this vine grow on the, I have. The, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. Will it be okay? I mean, once it gets too crazy, we'll start taking it off there, but. I think it's for beautiful. For now, it's kind of neat. And, and if you it's notice. It's accessorized. Absolutely, and if you <laughs> notice in this area, I've let that happen where in other areas I don't. This area, I wanted to go for more of a park feel. Okay. So a little bit more of a style blending, northern flair, playground with yeah. a little bit of tropicality. So there you were talking about the orange bird. I love this bloom. It, I mean, I wish they bloomed all the time. I know. Mine just came out too. The, these blooms are just absolutely stunning. And the color variation in them is fantastic. And again, they're fairly low maintenance keep them trimmed. Unfortunately, RJ's neglected this one. <laughs> I'm what sure a beautiful, that's beautiful true. bloom. And, and the name obvious is pretty obvious, right? It looks like a bird's head. It does. So this is a hibiscus, correct? It is. Do we know what color it's the, gonna bloom? Yep, the, this is a red blooming it. hibiscus. 
Again, really low maintenance. Oh, yes. They get knocked down in the, yep, they get knocked down in the cold. They're pretty hardy. You trim them back and they come back like yeah. nobody's business. I know, they, they are nice. So this, I actually like this spot to talk about. Um, you know, just kind of bushes that go up against the house. Mm -hmm. So hibiscus I see used all the time. Sure. And then what are those back there? So that particular foundation planting is... Foundation planting. Yep, viburnum odoratissimum. It's a faster growing viburnum. It actually lends some protection from sun, some protection from wind. A lot of people get nervous about the root system of plants being planted close to the house. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of hedges. I think they have a, a right place. And if used properly, the roots are non-issue. Okay. They hit the foundation, they turn. They don't wanna go into your concrete. They wanna take the path of least resistance. They're just looking for water. And let's talk about this tree on the other side of the fence. It's an unusual tree yep, um, sure for is. this neighborhood. So that is actually a bottle brush tree. It's rather mature and has seen better days, but when they do bloom, the blooms are beautiful. I have no problem using them in a, even a uh, style blending fashion or a Northern fashion. The wonderful part about them is they do attract honeybees, which if you have other flowers, honeybees are essential. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about lawn care. First, I want to ask you, what are the most popular types of grass that we see here in the Tampa area of Florida? Sure. I think right now, all of the strains and varieties of the uh, St. Augustine are the most popular. There's several different strains. I'll tell you a little bit about maintenance. It's, again, important that they're fed, properly watered, not overwatered because you want a strong root system. And when that doesn't happen and the yard starts to fail, it's very difficult to bring that back. Right. I get called out a lot. Uh, for lung and sod replacement. And a lot of people say, ask me, can you patch that? Because there's some green left. Well, typically the green that's left is invasives. It could be nutsedge, wild Bermuda, torpedo grass, other noxious weeds. At that point, it's typically best to eradicate everything and start fresh. Sometimes it'll even be more cost effective just to start new and fresh rather than trying to bring back a yard that's too far gone. Right. A lot of builders will put in bahia grass in the backyard because it doesn't require as much water. Is that correct? correct? It is. Um, and a lot of the builders are also not wanting to put in an irrigation system in right. the backyard. Typically, our customers that call us out, I encourage them to put in an irrigation system. It's nice to have. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and it not be there. Right. Right. And also, by having that, you have more options on what to put in, not just with grass, but also with plants and trees. So one of the things that Northerners don't realize is our grass, especially the St. Augustine varieties, are, is very thick, kind of itchy. You don't really want to roll around in it. So for somebody <laughs> who really wants their Northern soft grass, are there any choices for us here in Florida? And will you please change my lawn to that? Absolutely, there <laughs> are, um, but it depends on whether or not you have the proper conditions for it. Okay. Um, one of the strains that I love is zoysia. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with that. In particular, I like empire zoysia. zoysia. It works well in the sun, not so much in full shade or even high shade areas. Okay. Requires less water, drought tolerant, does go dormant in the winter, but comes back in the spring. Yeah, I, in my neighborhood, there are a couple of people with zoysia grass, and I've noticed that that it co that it goes dormant in the winter, and I'm always a little bit panicked for them thinking that their grass is dead. But it is so much softer and looks very pretty when it's well maintained. I like it too. Is it more expensive? It's a little bit more costly, but here's the the upside of that: you use far less water, you use far less. Uh, uh, pest control, and actually you don't have to even fertilize quite as much. Okay, so pest control, that's another thing that I always have to recommend to my clients is to have some sort of pest control in their lawn itself. Mm -hmm. Anything you can say about that? Go to the professionals because that is a moving target. It is, it is. I, I, I mean, so much so. What works today may not work a week from now, may not work a month from now. Now, are there landscape companies that do the pest control, the fertilization, the cutting, the trimming, the everything? I'm not familiar with them if they do. Typically, that would be more of a larger commercial, national, multinational company. Yeah, I think that's the, the problem is, you know, I have like the pest company and whatever they do to the lawn to keep the bugs out of the lawn, but then you have a, the landscape person too. Mm -hmm. So it's two different people. I think lawns just require a little bit more maintenance than most people are used 
too. Absolutely. So a lot of neighborhoods have houses that are really close together. It's hard to make your house feel like an oasis, which has been done in this particular yard. Thank you. Yes, it's absolutely beautiful here. Just to reassure everybody out there that even with a small space, you can create a nice backyard and front yard oasis for yourself. 100%, and that's exactly what we're going for here. Yeah, and create some some coverage between neighbors and, and things like that. Absolutely, and I think the neighbors will appreciate it as well. That's true. They get to enjoy the tops of all the landscaping. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much you for bet. joining us today. This has been fascinating for me. I absolutely love plants. If you guys have any questions for RJ, throw them in the comment section, and we'll have them back and have them answer some of those questions. But for now, thank you all for watching. With love, Melanie.